Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this SCI webinar on the chemistry of CO2 and its role in decarbonisation. My name is Mark Harrison, and as chair of SCI's Energy Group, and on behalf of the Society of Chemical Industry, I'd like to thank you for taking the time to join this webinar, the third and final in this series. For those of you who aren't already aware of the SCI, I'd encourage you to visit our website, and uh, details are shown on the, uh, the next slide on the screen. We're a charitable organisation founded in London in 1881, and we operate at the interface between industry and academia to foster innovation, members networking and development, and to contribute to the public understanding of science. In the area of decarbonisation, SCI publishes three significant journals, Greenhouse Gases, Science and Technology, Energy Science and Engineering, and Biofuels, Bioproducts and Biorefining. I hope you find today's webinar valuable, and I'll now hand you over to Peter Clough, who has kindly agreed to chair today's proceedings. Over to you, Peter. Hello. Okay, hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Peter Clough, and I'm from Cranfield University. I'm a lecturer in energy engineering, and as Mark mentioned, today I will be chairing this session. So I'd like to welcome you all to this webinar, and um, in this webinar we'll be learning and discussing the future opportunities of CO2 and the chemistry of CO2 and its role that it can play in decarbonisation and um, this has been organised obviously by the SCI's Energy Group and um, today we've got a fantastic lineup of speakers and the, we've got including uh, Christopher Rayner from Leeds University, we have Paul Wynn Stanley from Thorn Thornfield Technical Solutions and David Nepicato from Total. Um, we've also got a set of early career researchers who have won the poster competition and they'll be presenting their exciting work too. So this is the final of um, this series of webinars and um, we will be hopefully hosting a new one, a new series next year and I'll give you some details of that at the end of this session. So um, we also have in the background uh, Mark and Geraint, who if you've been attending the other webinars up until now, you know they're, they're working diligently away in the background. Um, so hopefully this will run perfectly smoothly. So um, before I introduce today's speakers, um, oh, I've skipped over that slide. Eh? So what I will do now is I will have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, which is Professor Christopher Rayner. So Chris Rayner is a professor of organic chemistry at the University of Leeds. He's been there for over 30 years now and his research interests are focused around various aspects of sustainable chemistry. Now, of course, Chris Rayner is particularly well known for his work on carbon dioxide chemistry, which in 2009 led to the formation of Sea Capture. And Sea Capture has been in the news quite a lot recently, um, particularly in work with Drax, with Drax Power. And um, Sea Capture is a university startup and it's led the way in really pushing forward this um, CO2 capture technology. So um, it'd be really interesting to hear some more about it. And I will now hand over to you, Chris. Okay, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, thank you everybody uh, for attending. Thanks to uh, Mark and Garant and the, the SCI for the opportunity to, to actually uh, talk to you today. Uh, okay. Um, so, as, as, as Peter said, uh, I am an academic at, at the University of Leeds. I've been for about just over 30 years now. Uh, and sort of last 20 years or so, I've been doing a lot of work on carbon dioxide chemistry. And initially, a lot of it was under pressure, so supercritical CO2 chemistry. But in the last 10 or 15 years, I've been much more interested in chemistry at, at, at CO2 at atmospheric pressure. And that's led to, to various uh, activities, particularly in, in carbon capture and, and storage. And that's really what I'm going to tell you about uh, today. So what are we doing uh, in terms of uh, CCS? Uh, our main role is CO2 separation. As chemists, that, that's really where we can, we can fit in. Uh, and what we're doing here is we're taking a feed gas stream and we're doing some sort of process, some sort of chemical process usually for, for us. And out of that chemical process, what we get is two streams. One is which is pure carbon dioxide and the other is basically a, a gas stream of, of pretty much everything else. So the feed gas stream usually has things like nitrogen, and oxygen and CO2 in it uh, and we're just selectively taking the, the CO2 out and the way we do that is by having in our case a solvent that reacts reversibly with the CO2 
but it doesn't react with any of the other gases. So particularly nitrogen and oxygen, hopefully they're relatively inert to your solvent and they just come out the top of your, your absorb. So it's a relatively simple process with just capturing the CO2 uh, and then we can uh, uh, let everything else pass through. So as Peter said, we, uh, a lot of this is being commercialized through, through C Capture. It is a spin out established in 2009. So it's been going for just over 10 years now. Uh, and it's been quite a, uh, uh, an interesting ride, particularly the, the uh, ups and downs of the CCS area, trying to keep the company going in that sort of area has been quite a challenge, but we, we have done it. And that's, that's where we are at the moment. Um, the aim of the company was really to create the most energy efficient CO2 caps, capture solutions through chemistry and engineering innovation and one of the key things is the team that we've built up so for example just on the on the right of the, the slide here we've got uh, 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 Rose who's one of our senior chemists and Fatima one of our, our engineers and the key thing here is the chemists and the engineers have to work together chemists can't do it on, on their own we can develop some nice new chemistry uh, but actually you know to get that on the scale that's really uh, viable on a large scale we, we really have to work very closely with engineers and there's lots of iterations that we have to do where we treat the chemistry treat the engineering and it's very much a, 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 a very close relationship between the, the chemists and the engineers. And when we set up Sea Capture, I mean, it was always uh, it was an interesting project, an interesting opportunity. I, I, I must admit, I never really thought we'd get to the stage where we are now, where we, we've developed some really, really fascinating chemistry that really does have potential to play quite a significant role in uh, in combating climate change and you know, essentially saving the planet. Saves, saves a bit sounds a bit cheesy, but actually, you know, it, it really is vital now that we, we do everything we can. So why did we set up C Capture? Well, really, CO2 separation processes, they've been around for a long, long time, uh, but really, they haven't really moved on very much. So uh, this is a, an original patent from the 1930s by, uh, by Rod Bottoms. Uh, and basically, this uses amines. So amine chemistry for separating CO2 out of gas streams has been around for for the best part of 100 years almost. Um, and basically, the uh, process here is used for natural gas sweetening. So when natural gas comes out of the ground, it's got lots of hydrogen sulfide in there, it's got lots of CO2 in there, and they're both acid gases. So if you wash it with a basic amine, then the, the basic amine takes the, the, the CO2 and the H2S out. And so a lot of the work in CCS now has been a sort of an extension of, of that same, same concept. But of course, the gas stream is now very different. It hasn't got lots of uh, natural gas in there. It's got other things. So it's got uh, oxygen in there. It's got lots of nitrogen. Uh, impurities that often come uh, from uh, combustion, particularly coal and, and biomass, for example, you get small amounts of uh, metallic impurities that can actually cause all sorts of uh, problems when you're trying to, to, to scale all this up. And so what we really wanted to do was trying to develop a new uh, technology that was totally different to, to amines. Uh, and so if we do that, then it enables a step change in performance, step, step change in all sorts of characteristics if we rely on some quite different fundamental chemistry. And there haven't really been any developments on that for, for, for quite a long time. And so we do have some, some really fascinating uh, uh, technology. Uh, you can see it there in the bottle. Uh, I can't really say too much about what is in there, but you can now say that you have seen our, our, our solvents, or at least one formulation of our solvents. Uh, so that, those are two of our, our chemists there. Doug Barnes, the chap on the right, who's now head of chemistry at, at Sea Capture, he developed uh, our, our current leading leading formulation. It's very much uh, driven all the, the, the chemistry aspects of, of Sea Capture. And Rose there is, is one of our, our senior chemists that, that works with him. Um, so, you know, the chemistry is very innovative, it's very different to, to, to amines, uh, and that gives you all sorts of advantages in terms of uh, uh, performance and uh, <clears throat> And, and lifetime. So just to show you a little bit ha about how, how this, this basically works, uh, we have a flue gas coming out of a uh, flue gas source. In this case, it's a picture of a power station, but it could be anything uh, from sort of an iron steel manufacturing, cement works, hydrogen production, anything where you've got a large volume of, of a gas stream that's got CO2 in it. And so what you then do is you can uh, just uh, get my laser pointer you have an absorber here and uh, basically what you have is your solvent raining down this absorber at the same time you've got the flue gas blowing up the bottom and as the uh, solvent comes down the bottom uh, basically it picks up the co2 whereas all the other gases keep going up and eventually they come out the top of the, the absorber column 
So at the bottom of the absorber, you've got your, your, your solvent with the CO2 absorbed. And the key thing is that is reversible, and it's usually reversible by, by, uh, by uh, heating it up. And so we then pass the loaded solvent into the stripper, and the stripper typically operates something where between 100 and 150 degrees centigrade, something like that. And at those sort of temperatures, the CO2 comes off. So then the CO2 can then be compressed, and it can go off for utilization or storage or whatever. Um, and, and as the, uh, the solvent moves down the stripper, of course, more and more CO2 comes off. And by the time you get to the bottom of the stripper, all the CO2 comes off, and you've got your lean solvent again. Now, of course, to do this, you have to heat this stripper up to, to quite high temperatures. It's a very large uh, uh, vessel there. And of course, the way you normally do that on a power station is to take uh, steam from the power station. And that actually introduces quite a significant parasitic load on the power station and can reduce the, the efficiency by sort of 20 to 30 percent. So quite a, a big chunk uh, there. And so reducing the energy required for this, for this stripping process is actually very, very important. And that's one of the key things of the sea capture technology that I'll, I'll tell you about. So, as I say, it's wide, wide variety of gas streams, not just power stations, but uh, anything that's got uh, a gas stream with CO2 in it. So this tells you a little bit about the, the, the parasitic load that I mentioned that you typically get from a, 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 a CCS process on a, on a power station. You can see MEA, that's the original uh, technology that was developed in the 1930s. That's evolved quite a lot over the last uh, 10, 20 years uh, to, to something more suitable for CCS, where people use actually a mixture of amine, so what we call amine blends. And you can see you can get the energy you use down from about 3.7, 3.8 gigajoules per tonne of, of CO2 captured to around 2.8 gigajoules per tonne of CO2 captured. The current estimates for our, our, our solvent on scale are around 1.8, 1.9 gigajoules per tonne of CO2 capture. So you can see we've taken it down by roughly about 50% from the original uh, MEA technology that was first discovered. Even then, still a significant improvement also on amines. And this is, this is a, a key thing of, of, for our technology. That's just one aspect. There are many others. So for example, because our solvent components are, are so different, uh, one of the problems you have in an absorber is you've got lots of oxygen, and that can cause degradation, particularly of amines. Uh, but any sort of organic species in there, and we see very low levels of that with our, with our solvent components. They're also very low for recivity, and they've been designed to minimize any environmental impact. So much, much kinder all around, really. So how do we do this? Well, basically, when we start off developing a, a CCS process, we do it on a lab scale, about one to 10 grams of CO2 per hour, and it's typically in this, this piece of equipment here, which is vapor liquid equilibrium uh, apparatus, and this basically measures the solubility of CO2 at different temperatures and pressures. And from that, we can work out whether a solvent has potential uh, as a CCS agent or not. We then need to scale it up. And this is a, a pre-pilot demonstration plant here, basically, where you've got a cyclic system. So you can continuously load and reload your, your solvent. And you can really get a good idea of the performance of the solvent, see whether it's really worth scaling it up for the next, next stage. And then if that works out, then you want to take it to the next stage of full pilot. So between 100 and 1,000 kilograms of CO2 per day. I'll show you a picture of, of ours in, in, in a second. Uh, but that, that's where we really are at the moment. So we're at the full pilot demonstration stage. But, but basically what we're doing now is moving on to, to pre-commercial scale demonstration. So around the 100 tons a day sort of scale. Uh, and uh, I think Peter mentioned we were at the Drax, but this sort of scale there is, is 10,000 tonnes per day sort of scale for, for a single capture unit. So you can see there's quite a lot of challenges there to, still uh, to, to actually get to that sort of scale. And, you know, it's not just our technology there. A lot of the aiming systems also have not actually yet gone onto that sort of scale, although there are some large ones that I'll mention uh, towards the end. So this is our, our demonstrator on Drax. This picture's a little bit old now, but, but uh, it gives you the idea. Uh, so you can see it's, it's a shipping container, it's actually in two, there is another one uh, behind it, and then we've got absorbed columns at, at the top here. Uh, one of the reasons I like this picture is because you can see it here at the back, this is actually one of the gas ducts uh, from, from one, of, one of the boilers. So it's huge and you can see you can probably fit one of the shipping containers in there. And at the moment, this is, this is the, the uh, offtake we, we have from, from this, this, this duct, which is about 10, 10 centimetres, something like that. So we're going from something that's about 10 centimeters diameter 
to this sort of scale. Uh, that's 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 the challenge with where we are. So Drax is a very big power station, produces about 6% uh, of the UK power supply, biggest in the UK, four gigawatts generation, something like that. The other very important thing about Drax uh, is the potential for what we call negative emissions. And, and Drax were very forward thinking uh, quite a while ago, realizing that perhaps coal isn't going to be the best thing in the long term. And they moved on to, to biomass and this as their, as their main fuel source. And this actually gives you the potential for what we call negative emissions technologies or BECS bioenergy with CCS. So for many years, what we've been doing is taking carbon out of the ground, we burn it in a power station, generate heat, energy, uh, and we get lots of CO2 coming out of the, the top, essentially. What BEX allows you to do is essentially the opposite process. So what we've got at the moment is lots of CO2 uh, in, in the atmosphere, 400 ppm going up uh, continuously, of course, uh, and through photosynthesis, energy from the sunlight, that allows CO2 to be reduced and converted into, into biomass. Uh, and basically the, the biomass, if you harvest it, and particularly if you're able to use waste biomass, then you can make pellets, burn those, and if you capture the CO2 from those then, uh, and it, store them underground, you can see it's a mechanism for us taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and putting it underground. Now there are all sorts of uh, qualifications you have to make when you're thinking about effects. You've got to make sure you don't uh, use too much energy, for example, transporting the biomass around or harvesting the biomass uh, or using too much fertilizer, that, those sorts of things. Uh, but if you can actually uh, get this to work, it is a recognized concept by the, the IPCC and the Climate Change Commission so that it can actually be used uh, and counted as, as negative emissions. And of course, the better we do this, the lower the energy penalty, for example, in the capture process, and the more efficient this will be and the greater the potential for negative emissions. And if we're really going to reach net zero, you know, there are some things we really can't fully decarbonize. We're going to need some negative emissions technologies in the future, particularly by 2040, 2050. And so this is a, a really viable uh, method for that. Uh, just to show you, just to finish, uh, uh, that this thing, these kinds of things are real. This is a, a, a power station in, in Texas, Petronova, uh, uh, that has uh, CCS fitted on it, actually has CCS fitted on, a, on one of the, just one of their boilers, and it takes about 50% uh, of the flue gas from that boiler. Uh, this is the uh, system here, you can see on the, on the right, this is the, the, the large absorber column, so this is where you have your, uh, this is actually an amine-based system, so where you have the amine raining down in the absorber, and then the stripper is this uh, silverized uh, uh, container on the, on the left, and this is uh, uh, basically uh, at higher temperature, and the CO2 comes out at the top here, you can see the pipeline there, and and then this is the pipeline here that where the CO2 goes off. Actually, in this case, it's used for enhanced enhanced oil recovery, so it's actually um, uh, transported about 80 miles down uh, in the, the Texas coast to, towards uh, a an oil refinery, and they pump CO2 down there, and that actually helps oil uh, get get uh, oil out of the ground there. Not an ideal uh, use when when you're considering trying to combat climate change, but what it does do, it really allows you to demonstrate, build, and have a, a, a if you like, a financial incentive and business model to actually build these kinds of pieces of equipment, because they are uh, costing uh, a, a lot of money, they are a very significant investment to actually put it, put it in place there. So net zero, how do we get there? Uh, we need to fundamentally reduce global, global emissions wherever possible, of course. And renewables are going to play a huge role in this. So solar, wind, all these sorts of things. Uh, but CCS is also going to be a, a key part of the transition. It will be required to reduce emissions from sectors which are hard to decarbonize. So cement, and ink, cement for example, iron and steel, uh, glass and ceramics, all sorts of energy generation processes, waste to energy, for example, which still put CCS on the back of that, is potentially very useful. Uh, chemical manufacture, uh, uh, particularly oil refineries, for example, those sorts of things, and, and indeed hydrogen production. And of course, the hydrogen economy is going to be potentially very important to us again as we, we decarbonize towards 2050. So, these negative emissions technologies, such as BEX, will be required. Uh, most pathways that limit global warming to one and a half degrees really rely on large scale deployment of negative emissions technologies like, like BEX and, and probably afforestation. But you've seen you know, some of the problems with wildfires in California and Australia and stuff like that. Forestation, you have to be really careful where you do it, uh, and you know, 
potentially it's, it's not permanent storage of CO2, so we do need to be really careful. And I think sea capture technology very well placed to make an important contribution uh, in this, this area. Uh, just to finish there, there is, there, there's some of the team. I'll just point out a few, few key people. There's Doug Barnes, our head of chemistry, who developed a lot of the original chemistry. Uh, also been with us pretty much for the duration is Kasper Schulderman here, who's our director of engineering and our chief operating job officer. He's, he's really led all the engineering uh, aspects from, 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 from the start, really. Uh, this is our Tom White, our, our CEO, who's uh, doing a fantastic job taking over relatively recently in terms of leading the company. Um, and I'll just point out Helen Atkinson at the back there. So Helen's our business development manager. So if, if there are any opportunities that you'd like to discuss with Sea Capture, then Helen is always the person to, to first get in touch with, or, or myself, of course, uh, and, and Helen's email is, is there. So I'm also very grateful to all our uh, supporters over the years. We've been going 10 years, it's, uh, well, over 10 years. Uh, and so we couldn't do that without significant support from our investors. IP Group originally kicked off the project and, and have been with us for the duration, but now we have Drax on board and also BP Ventures, uh, uh, who, who have been very, very supportive and indeed are providing ongoing support for us. And also Bayes, uh, they've been very, very, very uh, generous to us in terms of helping us develop the technology. And of course, from my own perspective, the University of Leeds giving me uh, sort of freedom to, to keep involved in, in, in sea capture and help us uh, get it onto the, the scale that it really needs to be. So I'll finish there. Thank you very much for your time uh, and hand back uh, to Peter. Thank you. So yeah, thank you very much, Chris. Um, I, know, I suppose one quick question is, you mentioned about tracks changing from coal to biomass and did that change in fuel type significantly affect your process or was it something that was easy to manage? Well, fortunately for us, um, uh, we weren't involved with racks when they were using coal. Okay. Uh, so it's only really been uh, since, well, in, in the last sort of five five years or so that uh, that we've been wor working with them. Well, actually, shorter period than that, really. And, and all that time they've been working with uh, with, with with biomass. Uh, it is an interesting question because there are significant differences in the impurities that you get in a in a blue gas stream, depending on whether you use coal or biomass or even you know natural gas. Uh, and, and particularly for things like coal and, and biomass, you can get uh, trace metal contaminants and they can be uh, oxidation catalysts, for example, and that, that can cause real problems if you, if you don't deal with those them properly. Um, the other very important difference between coal and, and biomass is uh, that coal has a lot more sulfur in it. And so uh, typically if you use coal as a, as a, as a uh, for power generation, you have to do blue gas desulfurization, whereas if you're using biomass, it's much less uh, in, important and so you know that, that's one of the key things that we've been looking at maybe can you repurpose the FGDs for example in a, in a large power station okay. to catch CO2 rather than rather than socks and not uh, so uh, that, that's an interesting idea I'm not sure it totally works a lot uh, but you know it's it's it's, it's an interesting concept. Oh, that's cool it's cool well I'm sure we have many more questions for you um, coming up at the end of the panel um, but yeah thank you very much Chris. Uh, we'll... No worries thank you cheers. Cheers. Okay, hopefully you can now see my screen. Okay, I can't actually tell what, what you guys can see and what I can see. So um, hopefully you can see it. Um, but if not, I'd just like to start by introducing our next um, speaker. So the next speaker is Paul, um, Paul Wynn Stanley. Paul is a chartered engineer. He has over 30 years experience of successfully delivering, delivering a, a wide range of projects. Some and these projects have been for some of the largest multinational companies around. Um, Paul is currently working on advanced renewable energy technology projects with Thornfield Technology Solutions. And he, this includes the ETI's Advanced Waste Gasification Demonstrator Project in the West Midlands with Q Technology. So uh, without further ado, I will hand over to Paul. Thank you very much. So, thanks uh, for the introductions. It's been a fantastic uh, uh, set of webinars this there's uh, a lot of information that's been been useful um let's say i mean some of the professor north stuff in the first section comes up in mine uh, as well as the other and, and as i say um uh, sort of yes I, i'm actively working with uh, q still supporting their plant uh, after eti as well so I, I thought i'd take a look at the the co2 market and the potentials for everybody and where people are currently working for this presentation, which is what a lot of what I've been doing uh, with ETI and uh, independently over the last year. So you know, we can see that the, the world production of CO2 versus the utilization of CO2 
is uh, at a quite a large disconnect as the emissions are in the gigatons range and the uh, CO2, world CO2 market is in the million tons range. So the one, one of the biggest consumers being uh, the fertilizer market in the world and the uh, food and drinks in the, uh, in the other sectors. So, but when we focus on the UK, uh, we see a, a slightly different story. Uh, the UK is actually the, the largest um, CO2 market in Europe. However, a, lot, a, sort of a substantial amount of our CO2 is actually imported from Europe. So it gives, again, interesting dilemmas. But again, we look, you know, we've got 360 million tonnes uh, being emitted and we've got as little as uh, 600,000 tonne, uh, 600, tonnes being consumed. So th there's large disconnects going on within there. The thing, you know, and you look at the sectors that might be able to capture the CO2 from, you know, it's going to be energy supply, it's going to be business and probably some of the others, a bit of the waste management. Agriculture probably, uh, whilst being a big emitter, is also one of the options for storage. You know, people are actively looking at what um, active materials could be added to the land to strip CO2 from the rainwater and uh, improve the soil quality. You know, there are research projects happening. Residential heating, pretty much the only way that's going to be decarbonized is either switch to electricity or switch to hydrogen in the future. And again, there are, there are projects looking at that. So we know that our CO2 production is going to drop from 366 because it has already dropped. And our goal is to be net zero. Uh, and, and currently we have this 600,000 tonne market of CO2 that doesn't really look like it's going to change. Uh, in fact, it looks like it might rise in anything. So uh, ETI and CO2 stored have done a lot of work into where around the UK uh, we could utilize st uh, geological stores. And the UK is, uh, is blessed with an awful lot of these. It's typically up somewhere around 78 uh, gigatons of storage around the UK. So again, we can see that um, there's plenty of room for storage, uh, but the costs of this at the moment are um, unhappy as, as, the car, as, a, as a carbon tax or something similar comes in, then clearly there will, there will become a, a tipping point where the stores become more viable. Um, I think the, the interesting side around some of that, and there's a lot of speculation that in reality the first stores might need support, a lot more support from government to start running. Then once the business is in place, it, uh, it might well take off, and, uh, but that would then rely on a carbon tax type system. So the northwest of England has recently had its uh, gas fields in the Irish Sea approved for CO2 store. Um, so again, that's an interesting one. I think that's the, the hydrogen project in Cheshire that it will probably support that. So, you know, where might uh, where might you where might this CO2 be stored from processes? So, you know. Because of where the off-site uh, stores are, you're limited really to locations in the UK. So you're suddenly saying that if you looked at one hat on, this is the only place we could have CO2 emitters. And uh, we know that's not really going to be practical for a country that uh, is distributed in its own nature. The advantage of, of these areas is these areas typically have got very large chemical plants in. So if you're looking for CO2 utilization to chemicals, polymers, um, then the facilities are already there uh, to be converted to utilize CO2 instead of oil, uh, but the technology is still need to get there. So we have to start looking at how can we serve the other areas of the UK? Uh, what, what methods are going to be there for that in the future? So, uh, so some of this sort of came from uh, some of this was covered by Professor North earlier on as well, sort of combustion capture and utilization of CO2. Now, most of the papers and studies out there, they all support there are two forms, pre-combustion, post-combustion capture. So pre-combustion, you've got much smaller volumes, generally at pressure. Um, this is happening today with things like biomethane, the same as the decarbonization of uh, uh, natural gas fields that have had large CO2 uh, volumes within them, which wasn't typical of Britain, it was more America and Holland have that type of natural gas fields that they discovered. 
the post combustion is exactly the stuff that uh, was, was just talked about, sort of uh, from take from the flue gas, and you know the, the, the costs to these are uh, are not exactly insubstantial, and they're currently adding large challenges to industries to how do they utilise it and how do they still make money. Um, and that's why there's a lot of trials going on to try and pull down the costs. Several of the CO2 capture technologies are making this goal for £30 or lower capture costs. But that's just to capture the CO2. It doesn't include the compression of it for use. So it's effectively generating CO2 at atmospheric pressure. So companies like LanzaTech can do pre or post combustion. It's uh, um, a biological uh, process that, uh, that works it. Carbon Clean uh, are doing an awful lot in the in the biomethane market as well as the post combustion. But the the, the reason I've shown like that is because you can see that most of them can use either, and some can only use uh, sort of clean air CO2 because they don't want the hydrocarbons, and you don't also want to lose any of the hydrogen or the uh, other elements, uh, so things like deep branch making proteins from um, from CO2. They need some hydrogen um, to, to do that, but uh, it's it's about getting the balances right. So we then start looking at the existing markets for CO2 and the opportunities. So currently, most of the uh, CO2 in the UK for the food grade market actually comes from um, uh, natural gas conversion to hydrogen, generally in the ammonia market. Um, so, the, and, uh, and the other one is from the um, bioethanol market where they're taking the CO2 off. So that's where most of it comes from in the UK, and then the balance is actually imported. So that's all covered by food grade CO2 product, production. So you're limited to your feedstock. Uh, you're limited to your process and you have to have a lot of uh, authorization put in. But we can see with the ammonia market, they're starting to search for greener hydrogens. Um, so that then gives us a, a problem because currently the ammonia plants are the main ones providing the CO2 to the urea plants uh, and it's, it's close looping within there. So um, more stuff needs to be found in the future. So you know, we look that there are people now interested in uh, producing chemicals, producing hydrocarbons, producing um, concrete, aggregate, all those sort of things. A lot of those don't really need food grade CO2. So that might open the gasification of solid market with CO2 separation and increase because the nobody's foreseeing the food grade CO2 market reducing from its 600,000 tonnes. But because it's food grade, it's a closed loop system. So your existing transport system couldn't transport non-food grade CO2. So the market needs to be big enough. And currently the people trying to utilize the, the system in the concrete sector particularly are utilizing, are putting additional strain on the UK uh, food, food grade CO2. So, I say we look at the existing market, 600,000 tons food, as I said, it tends to be sort of liquefied CO2 sitting at about 20 bar uh, with refrigeration to keep it chilled. So there's some reasonable energy demands there. If, if we look at the, the storage market, the storage market's looking more like 110, um, somewhere around 110 bar and liquid dense phase to actually transport it to reduce transportation costs. So obviously at 110 bar, it doesn't really need cooling, it sort of stays there. But the, the urea, the aggregates, the ready mix concrete, the liquid fuels, they don't need it at those pressures or, or, or quite at those pressure and temperatures, although some would benefit from it. So it's, it's where does it go? Uh, you know, these are all the additional ones. So we can see that some of that, uh, some of that 300, and, 336 million tonnes that's available, perhaps could start feeding some of the others and maybe from the more known feedstocks could start feeding the um, feeding the food market in the future as well.
yeah, the when you look quickly at the um, ready mixed concrete markets or the aggregates markets, so the ready mixed concrete market in the UK, if it all switched over to a CO2 based one, could consume over 100,000 tonnes, and the aggregate market could consume another 100,000 tonnes. Again, still a large mismatch. So, again, we look at the uh, the existing food grade market. The thicker the arrow is typically where the um, where the current uh, consumption is. So the majority is the carbonated food and drinks, uh, and I say uh, that's one of the largest markets in Europe, single markets. But uh, you know, some is obviously going to welding, semiconductors, uh, things like that. So you know, the import of food graded CO2. Uh, potentially from next year will also now be a challenge. So what do we do? How do we deal with that? Uh, we need to start generati generating our own stuff and start to become more independent, more self-sufficient. So we start now looking at the technologies that are available. Again, Professor North covered some of these, electrolyzed and catalyzed, uh, solid oxide fuel cells and catalysts. Uh, reduction and biological. And again, you, you can see from the flow charts where these uh, uh, these processes could pass on to. So the, the electrolyzed ones, I mean, typically that's uh, electrolyzing the CO2 or CO2 and water to generate a syngas that you'll then put into a catalytic process to generate the product that you want, whether it be a polymer, whether it be a hydrocarbon, uh, whichever. Uh, solid oxide fuel cell, much the same, it just operates at a much higher temperature sort of, uh, than the other one. The reaction based ones, they tend to be producing aggregates, sodium bicarbonate, um, you know, sort of Tatar in, in Cheshire has recently converted their gas fired CHP to generate their sodium bicarbonate. Um, but it, again, that's from clean natural gas because it's food grade, because the sodium bicarbonate is actually entering the um, medical market, the pharmaceutical market, as well as the um, as well as the food market. Yeah, a lot of these are trying to tell us that they're at a high TRL level. Um, the electrolytic ones uh, from their supply chain are, are suggesting that. Uh, but really, we're only seeing small-scale plants, and we're seeing large, um, large requirements for the future. The aggregate market's working well in the UK, but the concrete market, I'm seeing a lot less of. So these are these are some, not all, of the players in the uh, electric conversion market. It's just a, a typical example. Uh, and as I said to you, the you know, so, some are claiming that they'll sell product to you now that will work. Uh, several of the, the ones such as uh, BSE and uh, Holder Tokos, they're actually commercially selling uh, electrolyzers into the, into the carbon monoxide market, uh, particularly in some American sectors where the transport costs of the, carbon monox of the bottled carbon monoxide start to outweigh, and they can actually cost effectively, make people self-reliant, converting their CO2 into CO for the chemical industry. So again, things are happening as they go on. But the electrical requirements for these are are huge. You know, I mean, two tons of CO2 would, would require somewhere around two to four megawatts of electricity to convert it into CO. Uh, and on the back of that, we'd also need something similar or larger to turn water into hydrogen to give you the signal gas to generate the, the output. So it's it's um, it's there, but they're, they're all reliant on a, a very clean um, electrical supply to them to make sure they do offer the reduced CO2 that, that's required. So th there are some people then doing just catalytic processes. Um, the, the lower two, uh, the ones that sort of are very, very low TRL levels, so they're, they're using catalysts, one at high temperature, one at low temperature, to generate solid carbon, carbon nanofibers, carbon, you know, that type of material, which has a good value, um, but they need to be driven up the TRL level so that they can be shown, can they deliver that at scale? And then you've got the, the, the top two are typically generating 
uh, polycarb polycarbonates and poly oils from from the CO2. Um, they're suggesting it looks it, it looks interesting, uh, and they obviously have got some large plants operational around the world. But again, the polymer market tends to be big as it is big now within the um, within the, the, the crude oil market. So I think they they may well suit better to these places where they are already to operate at scale with the CO2 captured from local industry and other industry slowly replacing the CO2. But we will need to find some very, very large electrical supplies for those, as the Humber project shows, uh, where they're putting a, an offshore wind farm that's going to be dedicated to the, um, the hydrogen plant uh, by, by the refinery there. So, We look at the the reaction and conversion again. Um, there's there's many people. These are just a few to, to mention. The top ones are tending to produce a an aggregate uh, to support the concrete market, and again they have the potential to to store in the UK alone hundreds uh, hundred thousand tons of CO2 a year, reacted into solids to replace quarried material. So there's, there's transport benefits. There's um, there's many things that they all require some some of the uh, active wastes, such as um, some of the flue gas treatment systems that are sometimes classed as hazardous waste. They're reacted within there, and uh, they generate the, the the aggregates from that to go into concrete. Uh, the bottom two, car carbon cure, uh, are typically using a, a CO2 additive in the ready mix market, which uh, improves the quality of the um, of the concrete and improves the cure time whereas Solidia are actually looking at, at using carbon calcium silicate cement instead of ordinary Portland cement uh, which can be made with a lower energy requirement because the, the, the uh, temperatures to generate the cement are sort of 30 percent lower um, but not just that they can actually replace a lot of the potable water in their concrete with with, with CO2. So uh, again, interesting thing uh, for the future and certainly one that um, might work well in the distributed energy side. The biological conversion, uh, you know, I, mean, I think some of the lead ones in there you'll all recognize and so the plants again are growing in size um, and starting to prove that they can effectively deliver chemicals, proteins, um, you know, so some of the formic acids and the fertilizers, are, some of the formic acid ones are a bit more, a bit lower on the TRL level, but they're getting there and they're starting to utilize CO2 at a lower cost and lock it in. So for me, when, when I summarize the CO2 market in the future, um, I think exactly as, as has just been said, storage is going to be key to supporting us meeting our net zero. Um, I feel that um, if we want to get distributed energy, we do need to look a little bit further because we need to deal with some of these distributed CO2 emitters um, that may continue to, to, to emit CO2. So we need to find a way of cost effectively utilizing that CO2 on a distributed network. I think the, as I said, on the storage side, there's definitely a, an option sort of on those pipelines for those chemical facilities towards the end to utilize that CO2. Um, for their co-polymerization, for their oils, for their hydrocarbons, um, but we need, we'll need to solve this large electrical demand that they require for that. They will need an awful lot of low carbon and electrical power to support that. Um, I think typically when I was having a, a quick look at numbers, you know, one kilowatt hour of electricity will produce about 0.4 kilowatt hours of liquid fuels. So we, we definitely need that electricity to be um, low CO2 to be able to support that type of thing even in the short term. So I think there's a, there's a lot of pressure on the universities, on the um, on the innovators to find the technologies, other technologies that can distribute the use CO2 and, uh, and, and pass it forward. Um, you know, and and there, there are some big challenges that we're putting out there to the universities. They are grabbing them as Professor North showed. Um, and, and as, as other people have shown, that's what we need to do, find some distributed means of utilizing CO2. Concrete looks like an interesting short-term one in the UK, maybe long-term, 
because um, they can afford to pay for the carbon dioxide and still make concrete at a level. But for some reason, those sort of ones aren't being pushed heavily in the UK. They actually seem to be more North American uh, than, than European and British. So we, we need to overcome some of those issues as we move forward. So thank you, and I'll pass back to the organisers to summary and, and pass on to the next one. That's great. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you. Um, so I had a, a very quick question. I was just thinking you've presented um, all of these different options that we can use CO2 to make useful things with. Um, is there any really easy wins that is just we, we, we should be doing it already? The, the, just a quick thing that we can go straight ahead and do? Uh, well, the, the one that I suggest is I don't understand why Britain isn't further ahead on the concrete sector. It does look like that can lock quite a lot in. Um, but it all seems to be North America. They're using, so that they're, they're giving it some improved savings because they're using liquid CO2 to manufacture the concrete, which then improves the quality of the contract to reduce concrete, reduces the cure time from 28 days to uh, 20 to 24 hours, and mm -hmm. improves the fuller stability and things like that. Yep. Um, but it's being driven in North America. I mean, even concrete, even concrete cure, and there are other ones. It's not just those. Two that are just there, the two that sort of jumped to mind for me. You know, they're adding CO2 as an additive into a CO2 into a concrete market, so they're readily suitable. Uh, I don't know why we're not seeing more of those types of ones in the UK, particularly for the distributed energy side. But okay. CO2 is a very stable chemical, so it's always going to cost to, to put it to something that's not going to emit. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of a, a really annoying thing about thermodynamics is that CO2 is quite stable. It's, it's annoying that it's quite stable. It'd be more useful if it wasn't. But yeah, uh, okay. so some of the, the very interesting ones that I saw at very low TRL again, and I'm, I'm, and I'm talking to UK universities and they're not biting and don't understand why. We, we look at the um, the Australian university where it's, it's, uh, it's on one of my slides here, the Australian one that's actually uh, looking at room temperature, room pressure, treatment of CO2 with liquid liquid metal catalysts to convert CO2 to carbon, or C2NC, who again are they using high temperature to convert CO2 to um, to, to carbon again, um, mm -hmm. and both of them are saying on the smaller scale it looks like they can produce carbon fibres cheaper than the current carbon fibre technologies, and cool. sort of. 80% cheaper is what they're saying, um, okay. and they are moving forward, you know, but they're moving forward slowly because they're trying to find the money. But again, I don't know why British universities aren't looking at the same types of things, because that probably would be a good answer, because even if we didn't need the carbon fire, but we could effectively drop it back into a coal mine, because it would just be clean carbon. Sure, sure. Is it I suppose it's a good stable method of carbon storage. It's been proven for a couple of million years now. Yeah, yeah. So there, there are a few areas that I'm wondering why the British aren't doing more about. Well, maybe we can continue that conversation, ask the, some of the academics later, <laughs> why aren't you doing this? Yes. Um, but for now, I, I will pass, or I will uh, take control. And um, okay, so. Um, then I'll start introducing our next speaker. So um, our next speaker is David Nevercato. Um, David Nevercato is a research program manager at Total. He's working on CO2 and CCUS related research. After completing his engineering graduate, he then went on to complete a PhD in chemical engineering and has now built up 20 years of experience in the refining industry. And he joined the R&D division in Total in 2016 where he set up the new CCUS Research and Development Programme. Um, and it was following the commitments from Total towards their climate strategy that this all began. So um, I'll now pass it over to David uh, to continue. Yes, that's, that's, um, thank you very much, Peter, and good uh, afternoon, everyone. Um, in this session, uh, we'll dive uh, a bit into carbon capture and storage reality and the way that Total is developing uh, CCUS technology and uh, business. Um, 
well-known uh, and unknown development technology uh, should uh, be deployed on a large scale to limit uh, global uh, warming and reduce CO2 emissions. According to this scenario on this slide, it's very similar to IPCC or IEA scenario. By meeting global warming to below G degrees requires achieving carbon neutrality in the second half of the uh, century. But uh, how can uh, this be achieved? Uh, first of all, by reducing CO2 emission uh, linked uh, to human activity, by developing uh, low carbon and renewable energy, by improving uh, energy efficiency, and also by deploying uh, CCUS, uh, CO2 capture and geological storage for CO2 emission that are difficult to eliminate. This will not be enough because some uh, CO2 emission and other greenhouse gas uh, this will remain. And therefore, achieving carbon neutrality will require to capturing these uh, greenhouse gases, the CO2 in, in the atmosphere, to store it uh, in the soil and uh, deep underground, and thus bringing uh, the carbon back to where it comes from. In these scenarios, energy uh, emis uh, negative emissions are projected to reach uh, 6 uh, um, billion tons uh, in uh, 2050. Uh, it's a current size of oil and gas industries, uh, so it's a big challenge to develop it, and to uh, 20 billion tons by uh, to, uh, 2100. Uh, so, uh, negative emissions should be uh, developed uh, in the coming years, and we could divide the negative emission technologies in two broad categories nature based solution. Uh, or natural carbon things, as forest, carbon soil uh, storage, and uh, technological uh, solutions, like bioenergy production or direct air capture, coupled uh, with uh, geological storage uh, of CO2, uh, most uh, named as uh, BEX or DAX. So, climate experts view CCUS as a tool uh, indispensable to fight climate change. And by uh, 2050, CO2 so storage should be represent around 10% of the necessary reduction effort. This should generate a huge growth and an activity that will continue for a long period as a negative emission we will be required at, till, at least uh, till the end of the century. The total ambition is to become uh, the responsible energy major. This is uh, thus its mission is uh, to provide energy that is reliable, affordable, cleaner, and accessible to as many uh, people as possible. And uh, in May uh, 2020, uh, Total announced uh, this mission to get a net zero uh, emissions by 2050 together with the society and for its global business across its production and energy products used by its customers. More especially, Total is taking uh, three major steps. Uh, towards achieving these emissions. So, uh, an objective of a net zero across uh, total worldwide operation by uh, 2050 or sooner. A commitment uh, to net zero across all this production and energy products used by its consumer in Europe by 2050 or sooner. And an ambition uh, of 60 or more reduction of this uh, carbon average, uh, average carbon intensity of energy uh, products used worldwide by total customer by 2050, uh, with intermediate steps uh, of uh, minus uh, 15% by 2030 and uh, minus 50, uh, 35% by 2040. Um, within framework of the GHS protocol, total is the uh, between three types of mission, emissions. Scope one, and the scope one is a direct emission from sites. Scope two is an indirect emission related to purchase energy consumption of uh, operated uh, sites. And uh, scope three is a other indirect emission. And total report in scope three only the CO2 emission linked with the use of product use uh, by our client and the product sold by total, and uh, which is the most significant in terms of the CO2 emission. The first part of the ambition of Total uh, is to become carbon neutral for its own GHS uh, emissions, for its own production facilities. So it's uh, concerns scope one and scope two. So we have control over these emissions 
and uh, are responsible of them. So assuring uh, carbon neutrality across these ports is an, uh, an obvious uh, goal for the time. We intend to lower our direct emission by improving energy efficiency, eliminating routine flaring, electrifying your process, and reducing methane emissions. And uh, to address uh, the residual emissions, uh, we are developing carbon sink, uh, such as nature-based solution uh, as forests, uh, or as well as uh, carbon capture and storage. So in your drive to, uh, toward carbon neutrality, we have set an interim goal of reducing uh, GHS emission to your oil and gas facility from 46 million tonnes per year uh, in equivalent of CO2 in 2015 to less than 40 uh, million tonnes of CO2 by 2025. And during the same period, uh, group uh, total production will have risen uh, by nearly 50%. So clearly it's a big challenge for your total and for your business to switch for uh, this uh, new type of uh, industry and new type uh, of facilities. Uh, about CCUS, so CCUS, uh, as it is a uh, industrial um, standard in industrial project management, uh, and projects uh, launched today are based on uh, mature exciting uh, technologies, uh, as uh, I mean uh, CO2 capture technologies, for example, uh, they are required to be scaled up and adapted to the specific uh, of the new business. Of course, we work as well as on future improvements to uh, your AD activities, mainly to reduce uh, the cost of the technology. Everything starts uh, with capture. So we can address a variety of uh, CO2 as well as the industrial or CO2 for decarbonizing your economies, but as well as uh, with uh, biomass CO2 or atmospheric CO2 for negative emissions. So the objective here is to separate CO2 from other components, create, uh, treat it uh, to exclude uh, contaminants such as water, uh, SOX, NOX, uh, or H2S, uh, to avoid uh, corrosion issues. As a general principle, uh, the more concentrated the CO2 is less expensive is the capture. Therefore, the first example today, uh, concentrate in uh, hydrogen production from natural gas, mainly uh, hydrogen produced by steam methane reforming, with uh, around 20% uh, of the concentration of the CO2. Or the process uh, CO2 generated by the cement and steel industry, and the concentration is uh, around 15 to 20%. So work is uh, being uh, conducted as well on lower concentrations, such as furnace, about 10%, gas power, uh, around uh, 5%, and even on the current uh, 400 ppm of the CO2 contained in the atmosphere. A key ac uh, action point for climate and operation efficiency is to decarbonize exciting plants through energy integration and heat recovery. And it's clearly a key factor to reduce the cost is to improve the energy efficiency of the whole overall CO2 capture technologies and integrate in the uh, current uh, facilities. So we draw this uh, expertise from your field operation, notably from your scale operator workers and uh, engineers in refinery and uh, gas plant. Once captured, the CO2 needs to be fitted for transportation and thousands of uh, CO2 pipelines exist in the world, mainly in North America and a few uh, in Europe. This transportation is usually done uh, in dense phase to minimize the transportation cost. Uh, and the pressure is around uh, 100 bar, uh, will enable the dense phase in all the temperature conditions. Uh, but CO2 shipping uh, is embryonic uh, today with a vessel carrying around one or 2,000 tons of the CO2. And it is one of the uh, northern lights under techniques. Once the flow grows, transportation requires building network and expanding flexibility. This is uh, what the uh, gas and the LNG industry have been uh, done for years. Next step is a question what to do with this CO2? Reuse or store? First so of all, reuse. This is a uh, uh, there are first the limited requirement for customers such as beverage industry and greenhouse uh, as presented before uh, by uh, Paul. Uh, but why it is seem better to reuse CO2 already emitted by someone else that produce it from this that purpose since ultimately this CO2 
will be vented in the atmosphere. For the rest, we enter the field of LED trying to incorporate CO2 in cement, uh, relative long uh, storage, or to produce a molecule such uh, as uh, e fuel uh, uh, in monomer, uh, ethylene, for example, methanol, ethanol. Store the CO2, the other one. So we, this is a permanent storage in rocks, acting like a liquid CO2 sponge, and we are developing deep, uh, geologic, uh, deep offshore geological storage. And the first question uh, for is uh, for is which permanent containment? So DPT gas field are well known for their operators and partners. You expected limited surprise uh, from the overall storage capacity as uh, these fields have been produced and they have been able to accommodate large hydrocarbons volume. And exciting and legacy wells uh, are in attention point. Is a past abandonment compatible with CO2 storage? Uh, this relates to mainly with cement quality and CO2 potential uh, uh, interaction with cement. Deep aquifer, at least none, but can represent a very large storage options, several hundred million tons or above. And uh, their evaluation is similar to oil and gas uh, exploration activities requiring seismic data acquisition and exploration wells. As a reminder, aquifer are rock containing very large salty water improper to human consumption. The second question it relates to the well injectivity. And uh, this is a direct impact on the future storage costs. And uh, we have to define the number of wells, mainly uh, it's a very strong impact on the cost, mainly in the offshore uh, CO2 so storage operation. And it is thus a very important uh, selection criteria for, for total project. Finally, we get uh, to the overall shell coordination. And for each single storage project, we, you will have various emitters for their own CO2, production profile, and logistics. There is a where energy chains uh, management comes into play. Long-term contract, deep interaction between each actors of this chain will give the necessary flexibility and generous cost saving uh, for all. This will as well form uh, the base of a good uh, CO2 counting, like energy and ga or gas, essential for meeting a public uh, expectations. Um, the, Paris, the Paris Agreement and the subsequent uh, net zero uh, carbon emission in Europe uh, regulations state support same uh, in the making and sale to removal incentive in the normal North America, are fueling a roaring wave of the project by 2030. This wave uh, could expand gradually uh, to other parts of the, of the world through an increased demand of uh, decarbonized uh, goods. By 2030, we see five times more activities than today with a shift to Europe, 40% of the activity uh, in Europe, uh, and will, uh, and uh, very clearly, um, a shift from EOR uh, storage, CO2 storage to a pure uh, geological CO2 storage. Growth and volume uh, to the creation of this mark market with competition on cost and quality. Um, renewable are an excellent example, and in these circumstances, CCS could start to become a merchant uh, activity in the next decade and be a very powerful tool to lead a net zero carbon ambition and decarbonize uh, your economies. We have talked about the general context, and it's time to not to focus on the North Sea, where we see a uh, starting project. For repair ambition yeah, and the resulting uh, 2030 state commitment have created a CCUS wave uh, in Europe. Work groups have been set up in various uh, European countries between the authorities and the CO2 emitters to develop roadmaps. And uh, at the same time, regulation have been written and objectives set in Europe. Another European countries lead the game and the other are maturing their view. Um, for total, uh, we have three uh, axes uh, that structures our current project roadmap. Uh, first is the Northern Light project, Norway. The other is to decarbonize your asset, it's mainly in uh, Benelux, in Belgium and Netherlands. And uh, we are studying uh, natural gas decarbonization, mainly in UK, through the Arcon project and the Teesside project. 
So currently, Total is uh, involved in a five CCS project across North Europe at a different uh, maturity level, and the Northlight uh, project in Norway being the most advanced. So just to three words uh, on Acorn. Acorn is uh, a project uh, where Total uh, uh, is, uh, is involved. Uh, it is in the study phase, and uh, we this project we produce uh, hydrogen from uh, steam methane reforming reforming and the CO2 is captured from this unit and we will store the CO2 in a, in a offshore geological storage. And the, the net zero T side project, we um, capture the CO2 from a, um, a, a carbon a CCGT uh, gas power. Um, and the idea is clearly to collect the CO2 in the industrial area and store the CO2 in uh, offshore geological storage. For the both project, it's a way to decarbonize the gas utilization through the hydrogen production or through the power production. Total has put uh, its uh, ID as uh, the service of the CCS uh, strategy implementation. And 10 percent of your of uh, it's a global annual budget of the RAD is dedicated to uh, to the CCS, and uh, 2030 RAD will be uh, nurtured by uh, RAD effort. So we are targeting uh, less uh, 100 dollars per ton cost for the European capture chain delivering CO2 in uh, offshore storage, and uh, RAD will help to reach uh, commerciality on par on par with uh, some of carbon prices targets uh, such uh, in the Dutch. Uh, for example. So CO2 capture is the main cost of the CCS share and reducing the cost of the CO2 capture requires the integration of the incremental uh, improvement but also the breakthrough innovation um, uh, will, that will significantly reduce the cost of the CO2 capture uh, especially with a dilute CO2 as um, CCGT through gas or direct air capture. We invest about around uh, 20 million euros per year in RD on CO2 capture. And one of the examples, we are working uh, with uh, quantum computing to formulate uh, new materials and uh, to reduce energy requirement for CO2 capture. Your RD action accelerates the development of uh, innovative CCUS technologies. So we have partnership with world-class academic uh, laboratories, Stanford University, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, College of France, uh, Imperial College, for example, with startup um, and uh, with also with demonstrate uh, infrastructures such as uh, uh, Technical Center of Montstadt of Natural Carbon Capture Center. So we are working uh, on sale to reuse and on the to storage. Uh, is a both application of, for the CO2 and to uh, to, 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 to develop uh, this uh, new technology uh, in this field. Um, you already uh, cover uh, fundamental research, mainly with academics, partnerships, up to demonstration phase of uh, innovative technologies. And to illustrate this, uh, let's take the example of uh, our development of uh, chemical looping uh, commission technologies. And CLC, uh, Chemical Looping Commission, developed by Total and IFUN uh, since 20, uh, 20, 2008, is it a commission process uh, that uh, produces uh, energy with inherent CO2 capture. Uh, in this technology, air. Uh, and fuel are not uh, directly mixed, but are introduced in two separate reactors, one oxidation and one, um, sorry, uh, and one is a combustion. Uh, the oxygen required uh, for the combustion is transferred for the oxidation to the combustion part uh, by a tiny metal oxide power around uh, 200 uh, micrometers. And uh, the combustion gas produce um, contains mainly CO2 and uh, water, and it is not diluted by nitrogen from the air. Just after water recovery, removal of NOx and SOx, but it depends on the quality of the feed. No additional CO2 capture step uh, is necessary. Uh, Semi-industrial uh, 3 megawatt chemical looping the combustion demonstration unit is being developed as part of the Sino and Shears project where biomass is one of the project fuels. And so this project is uh, with uh, Syntef as a leader of this uh, consortium 
with Total, IFPEN, Bellona for the communication, Quackover University, Zhejiang uh, University from Chinese part, Dongfang Boiler Company uh, as uh, manufacturers, and Tsinghua University. Uh, this project is uh, funded by the um, European Commission with through the Horizon 2020 and the Ministry of Science of Technology. And the next, um, so um, uh, the project is at the end of the year engineering uh, study, and the uh, demonstration uh, uh, will be started at uh, by 2022. And compared to uh, conventional power uh, generation uh, with biomass and solar force uh, combustion, so to capture uh, bio CLC capture can improve uh, a net electricity efficiency by 10 about 10 percent and reduce uh, avoided cost by uh, 20 uh, 30 percent. And the next phase uh, of the development could be uh, a full industrial demonstration of about uh, 30 or 50 megawatt thermic on biomass integrated uh, into a complete CO2 storage version. And we will have by this through a bio uh, CCS. So in conclusion, uh, is there's a few words uh, on overview of CCS development from ERID to the industrial project. And the CCS must find its economic model and a society acceptance. So the Northern Light project uh, is a good example of collaboration between uh, states, uh, public funding, industrial, such as Total, and we have uh, Total uh, have all the skills to carry out this uh, major CCS uh, project. Uh, thank you for, for your very much for your attention and um, I'm finished there. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, so it's really interesting and um, I was really interested to see the chemical looping project at the end. I, I wasn't aware that was going on, but that sounds very interesting to hear some more about that in the future. Um, I was wondering with Total and their, their extensive um, network of CCS operations around Northern Europe and around the North Sea, um, is this something that will be easily, um, or the knowledge will be easily transferred to other operations around the world? Or is it just specific to the North Sea? Is it technology or is it because the North Sea has the reservoirs already um, ready to go almost? It's clear we see that, uh, uh, first of all, uh, Total is one of the leaders in the uh, oil and gas business in North Sea. Uh, and uh, it's uh, one of the, the main reasons. And the other part uh, is we, we have a, a strong commitment to reduce CO2 emission from your facilities, refineries, uh, or um, gas power. Uh, so uh, we have to develop projects um, to capture CO2 and to store it. So clearly North Sea is the uh, obvious field uh, for us to, to store the CO2. And we see more CO2 storage mainly at, in offshore uh, rather than on onshore. Okay. Of course, it's for this reason that clearly the uh, North Sea is a nice place, a very good place to, to develop uh, this type of project. Okay. And at the same cool. time, there is clearly a strong support for North European countries to develop CCUS uh, project and to develop, uh, to, 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 to work, to, to define a business model uh, for the CCUS industry. No, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, I'm sure there'll be more questions uh, when we get to the question and answer session at the end. Um, but for now, what I will do is I will start sharing my screen. Okay, so now I'd like to introduce the next set of speakers. Um, all of these guys are um, early career researchers. They're all investigating some really cool topics around CCUS and um, they've been selected to speak because they are the winners of the SCI poster competition. So congratulations to all of you. Um, and I'd encourage everybody else who's participating and sitting in the call watching this is to go to the SCI website and have a look at the posters online. You can download them. I think they're online after this webinar. But yeah, certainly do have a go, look, go and have a look at what exciting research these guys are up to. Um, so what I will do is I'll pass over to our first speaker, who is Alex Bowles, um, who's presenting his work on the paralysis of waste for CCUS. Over to you, Alex. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, hello everyone. My name's Alex. I am a PhD student at Imperial College London, and I am going to be talking to you about the opportunities for carbon capture, utilization, and storage 
in the waste sector, specifically in tyres in the UK. So first of all, I represent a wider group that is looking at recovering more value, more material, more energy and more carbon from end of life tyres in the UK. We produce 600,000 tonnes of end of life tyres in the UK. Uh, they're primarily a hydrocarbon based product. They are really, really, they have a high environmental burden of both production and disposal. Um, production are, um, because they're primarily a crude oil based product. And for disposal, their tyres are really, really difficult to recycle. You've got the rubber and the steel and they're bonded together. And so separating those two is really, really tough. Uh, in addition, we they're, they're very tough to landfill. Um, they don't they don't like being landfilled because they're flammable and they entail a high explosion risk when they fill with landfill gas. So as a result, we incinerate over 80 percent of our tyres in the UK at the moment, which reduces which um, emits over a million tonnes of CO2 a year. So my group is well, I'm a PhD student. My supervisor is Dr. Jeffrey Fowler. He's an academic and a pyrolysis expert. Um, he has been working in carbonaceous materials for over 30 years and he's chair of the British Carbon Group. I have really good industry contacts who they who sponsor me. They include Duncan and Joe, who have lots of experience in um, project management, investment and manufacturing. So I'm really, really lucky to have access to these three people. So I'll talk to you about Pyro Energy first. That's the company that sponsors me. So their solution to this issue is to apply pyrolysis to end of life car tires. Pyrolysis means heating in the absence of oxygen to break larger, more complex organics into smaller ones which are then more amenable for recovery. So if we look at the current tyre life cycle in the UK, crude oil feedstocks go to a new car or a new car or truck tyre, it's then used and when it reaches the end of its life, it's incinerated. What we propose instead is to apply pyrolysis and what this does is it breaks the complex formulation of a tyre down into four products which are much more amenable for recovery. They include steel, which can be directly recycled, oil and gas, which can be combusted for energy or recovered, and a carbonaceous char. This carbon char is especially interesting because compared to incineration, what that carbonaceous char is, is captured CO2, so they're called pyrogenic carbon capture and storage. And if you apply this to 80% of the UK end of life tires, which is only one waste stream, you're saving over a million tons of CO2 a year. Um, in addition, when you process these products, you can produce all sorts of value adds for the economy, including electricity, hydrogen, chemicals, steel. But what we're particularly interested in is recover carbon black. Now, carbon black is a filler in black plastics and black rubbers. So what you are essentially seeing um, is the first sort of circularity in the tyre manufacturing process, if we can manage to get that carbon black back into tyres. Um, and Pyre Energy, we have a pilot line over in Grimsby. We decommissioned that last year and we're actually upscaling this process. We're about to open a 30,000 tonne a year tyre pyrolysis plant um, and we've upscaled to a continuous process. And we've, it's been a commercially viable model. It's profitable and it's going to provide um, about 50 jobs in the local area. So it's really exciting to be involved with that. I'm just going to talk to you briefly about my PhD as well. So it's very closely related to Pyre Energy. We wanted to answer the question of can we capture more CO2 using pyrolytic tyre char? So what I do is I take Pyre Energy's char, which I mentioned before, I activate it under chemical reagents in the lab. Um, and what this produces is a very microporous CO2 adsorbent. And the reason it's a CO2 adsorbent is because CO2 likes to likes to adsorb onto micropores of a very specific diameter, we can actually synthesize this, these from the char, which is waste derived in our lab at Imperial. And what this has the potential to do is capture over 10% of the weight of the carbon each time as CO2 and it's reversibly and rapidly. And you can regenerate this carbon indefinitely um, over a very long period. Um, and what you're looking at is a waste derived CO2 adsorbent, which can then be used in point source capture processes. So to conclude, I hopefully have convinced you that pyrolysis of wastes is worthy of thinking about in terms of carbon capture utilization and storage. Um, you can save several million tons just by pyrolyzing one weight waste stream, which is tires. 
And after activation, pyrolysis char is an effective CO2 absorbent, which provides an additional opportunity for carbon capture. Thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very, thank you very much, Alex. Um, what, I will, what I'll do is I'll go through all of the um, presenters first, and then we'll go to questions at the end. So um, thank you, Alex. I'll pass over to Harry next, who's going to be talking about the techno-economics of uh, a next generation hydrogen production process. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Yun Liang Yan. Uh, I'm very happy to to be invited uh, in this uh, in this webinar. So the title of my poster is Techno Economics Analysis of Low Carbon Hydrogen Production Through Sorption Enhanced Steam Method Reforming Process. So as we know, uh, hydrogen is a versatile feedstock which is widely used in oil refinery ammonia production and also the production of other chemicals and also the low carbon hydrogen is an attractive clean energy carrier which can be used for the clean energy transition uh, but the current hydrogen production is mainly focused on the steam mass reforming uh, which contributes around the um, 2.6 percent of the global co2 emissions in 2019 so to reduce the CO2 uh, emissions from the traditional SMR, so we investigate a novel process, which is called sorption enhanced steam method reforming, which combine the uh, SMR with castle looping, which we put the solvent inside the reformer during the natural gas reforming to produce the CO2 will be captured by the solvent. And the, the total reaction will be shifted to the right hand side uh, in favor of more hydrogen production. And one drawback of this uh, FEMR process is we require a large amount of heat for the regeneration of solvent. So we need um, a proper heat increase uh, with the consumer to reduce the CO additional CO2 emission. So in this work, we investigate the techno economic facility of the different uh, uh, SESMAR configurations, which can be integrated with um, oxfield combustion, uh, chemical looping combustion, and also uh, biomass fired consumer. And uh, we evaluate the process performance uh, in terms of uh, net efficiency, CO2 capture efficiency, uh, levelized cost of hydrogen, and also the cost of CO2 avoided and the removal. So we propose the different um, uh, SE SMR um, process, and uh, we use the uh, Anspen Plus software to to simulate the process performance and also follow the uh, typical chemical plant cost SP estimation methodology to calculate the capital and the operating cost. So in this slide, you can see the case performance of the proposed. Uh, SE SMR cases, as you can see, uh, when we increase the CO2 capture efficiency, and uh, the net efficiency will be reduced, and also uh, the capital cost and the operating cost will be increased. But among them, the case 3A, which is SE SMR integrated with chemical looping combustion, we can achieve nearly 100% of CO2 capture with the higher net efficiency and the lower level cost of hydrogen. So this figure shows the uh, level cost of uh, hydrogen of different uh, uh, SE SMR process. And uh, you can see the distribution of the different uh, components. So as you can see, the blue bar and the, the, so the blue bar and orange bar accounts for the large share of the uh, cost of hydrogen production, which is the capital cost and the fuel cost. And um, we also calculate the uh, cumulative discounted cash flow uh, based on the different hydrogen selling price. So as you can see with the high, uh, with assume the hydrogen selling price at uh, three pound per kilogram, all the investment of the proposed uh, SESMR process can be paid back after eight years. 
So to conclude, um, the level cost of hydrogen for the of the proposed SE SMR plan uh, is uh, is ranged from 1.9 pound to 2.8 pounds per kilogram, uh, which is comparable with the uh, uh, traditional SMR with amine based solvent scrubbing system. And uh, by applying a carbon price, uh, the cost of CO2 avoided and the removal it can be significantly reduced. So the results of this work uh, can provide a flexible option uh, for the blue and the carbon negative hydrogen production uh, in terms of the cost and the, the demand of hydrogen, uh, demand of CO2 reduction. So that's all. Thank you very much. Ooh, perfectly on time. My alarm's just going off now. Okay, stop. Okay, well done, Harry. Thank you. Um, so I'll pass over to our next speaker now, um, which is Dominika Zabigeb, Zabiga, um, who's got a presentation on carbon materials based on waste for CO2 capture. So over to you. Hello, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dominika and I'm currently working at University of Northumbria. It's my great pleasure to share my work with you that is actually dealing with design and fabrication of materials that will be coming from waste treatments and will be suitable for the carbon uh, dioxide capturing. So I would like to stress here that the work that I'm going to present here is uh, it's been done in a collaboration with Italian CNR and Spanish University of Alicante. As an engineer, a material engineer and why it's not working <laughs> and a physical chemist at the same time for the design and fabrication of the materials i'm using the physical chemical approach so please don't be surprised that you are seeing here the surface tension isotherms merged together with zeta potential so just give a very brief of how the, those materials are going to be designed and then how they are going to be presented and fabricated we are using for that as a template foam or emulsion um, uh, template so you can see also that for those emulsions and for those foams that we are going to stabilize with particles, which are presented here on the bottom left on my slide, um, we have to put them into the solution. And we need, we need to make sure that material that are going to be dispersed in that solution is going to be stable and is going to be um, going directly to the place that we really want to. So in those uh, measurements of surface uh, tension, we are looking for some kind of deviation when the material actually particles in here are going to do something irregular something that is unusual for us they are not going to follow the tendency the trend for the burst surfactant because they are merged in the solution with surfactants but they are going to do something unusual and on those basis watching the behavior of foams being focused on one single um cell foam cell we actually able to say that our design of the material, the entire structure starts from the single interface. We are able to tailor the material. We are able to send particles to be stabilizing the proper final material starting from the single interface. We are observing in that many different phenomena, carbon particles normally they are negatively charged. So we can observe even the charge neutralization in that process, sometimes char charge inversion phenomena as we are increasing the concentration of surfactant in here, and then the formation of the second layer of surfactant onto the carbon surface. Everything that we are doing here is actually helping us to send particles to the proper places to surround the bubbles of our foams and to give us the final structure that will be a very good base for the, for example, CO2 capturing. You might be uh, able to see right, just right now the four micrographs of those structures, so we are dealing here with activated carbon coming from West. Mentioning that here is because we've been called by our friends in Mexico who are telling us that they are struggling with actually coconut shells. There is a massive amount of them that they did not know what to do with and they told us. And we came up with an idea why to not put them into the particle form and then put them into the structure of the material. And this is what came out of our research. So you can see here, just those are the same particles. The only var var variation here is the concentration of the particles and slightly the size. And this is what is common for those uh, materials. It's an open interconnected structure 
with varieties in the thickness of the wall of those foams. So it's actually giving us very nice highway for the molecules of CO2 or any other gas to pass through and then be delivered to the very narrow porosity of those materials, giving us a very high specific surface area for, uh, for the interaction between the walls of those materials and the carbon uh, dioxide molecules. Those materials are also subjected to the thermal treatment just to be more uh, mechanically stable and to give us an idea what can we do further with them. So we've been trying three different temperatures, 500, 900 and 1500 Celsius. And we came out with um, an idea that probably the best one will be 900, but it's not that it was just our idea. Uh, we've been trying 1500 degrees. We increase incredibly mechanical structure and properties of our materials. However, as this activated carbon comes from the uh, family of uh, glassy carbons, is, it was giving us the structure that was very much more porous, so walls were much more smooth than in the 900 degrees. And we discovered also, um, following the optical observation of the, those micrographs, that in 1500 degrees, this narrow porosity is closing and it's not evident as in 900. In 500, instead, this porosity was not appearing as uh, certain organics was still inside of the structure of our materials. So the best way to treat those materials is at 900 degrees, um, creating very nice space for the molecules of carbon dioxide to be captured to. And we've been following different uh, measurements. We were trying to perform static and dynamic absorption measurements. For the static um, measurements, we came up with an information that, yes, we do have separation of gases. That was a mixture that we were using for those measurements. It was a mixture between, between nitrogen and CO2. CO2 was in the volume fracture of 16%, and we were able to observe the separation and then affinity with one of the gases, and in that case was CO2, obviously. Here, what you can see is the dynamic uh, measurements and the absorption in that uh, dynamic state. So when we are subjecting those materials to actual work, um, we've been closing them into some very special small tubes that were designed in the University of Alicante. And we've, and we've been running through the mixture of gas through them for a couple of minutes to see if there is any absorption, if the gas molecules actually are staying in the surface, uh, in the structure and then on the surfaces of our materials or not. And yes, they were. We've been doing those um, measurements, repeating cycles and cleaning in between the structure of our materials with helium. And we got to know that normally, what you normally can find in the literature is the number of cycles up to four. We've done six and uh, we've been very happy to say that after six cycles of these uh, measurements, we are still having 90 percent of absorption capacity within the structure of the, of the material. Of the monolith that we were producing. Um, the open porosity for those materials, just to summarize, was between 90 and 95 percent. This is giving us very high specific surface area for the reaction and interaction between carbon dioxide molecules and the surface of our materials. And I would like to stress that that working capacity was highly derived from the uh, hierarchical structure that we obtained in those materials. I hope that I convince you that um, using recycled materials, it's not a good, it's not a bad idea. It's a rather good idea, and it's actually helping in CO2 capturing and utilization. If you will be having further questions, I will be very happy to take them too. Thank you very much for your attention. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was awesome. Those yeah. materials look amazing. Um, I was very impressed with that. I was wondering if you've um, tried impregnating them with catalysts because I'm. I'm Kind of catalyst guy myself have we tried that and just see if they're any good for um some catalyst applications maybe i think there is a very uh, very good idea to go in that way we did not have time because covid happened and we kind of stopped those measurements but i would be very happy to to follow that idea yeah, yeah. Was, uh, i've been quite interested in those sort of framed materials before so yeah, it's very interesting to see that presentation okay so what i will do now is um I'll invite all the speakers back onto the virtual stage. So if you could all turn on your cameras and um, come back onto the front page, um, then we'll start up the question answer panel for the webinar. Okay, so um, 
we, we've had a series of questions come in um, during the talk. If there's any more questions from the audience, please do keep submitting them. Um, we are still looking at them. So one of the first questions, which I think is something everyone's been thinking about for a long time, is um, if we don't have a price of CO2, then how do we make this all happen? These are all fantastic ideas and um, we know that we need to do it. But if we don't have a price for CO2, how are we going to monetize CCU or CCS? Um, and what's the best path forward? So let's start with um, let's start with David. David, would you be happy to set one first? Oh, hang on, David, you're on mute. I can unmute you there. Okay, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Peter. So um, clearly for the, take the example of the Nozolite project. Uh, and a long ship project for the Norwegian government. Uh, we we have we have a strong support of the government in terms of the funding, and it's a way to to improve the uh, profitability of this uh, project. And the um, second end, um, in total, we consider that uh, the uh, price of the CO2 to to be sure of the robustness of the investment, and it's a way for us. Uh, when we set up a price on your internal uh, investment to uh, leverage uh, CCS uh, project uh, for your uh, CCS project for your for your facilities. Okay. Okay. Chris, I don't know if you want to um, chime in. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think there has to be a carbon price or something very similar to that. I mean, you know, the, the scale of this sort of thing to actually make it all work, you've got to have something like that in in in, in place. I, I know you know the, the UK government's looking at things like contracts for difference when you generate electricity with, if you're capturing CO2 at the same time and you're getting extra money if you're you're um, uh, if, if it's negative emissions, for example. Um, I mean, one of the ironically one of the leaders in this area is, is probably the US, where they've had something like a, they have a something called the 45Q tax credit, uh, where yeah. you get between 30 and 50 dollars, I think, per, per ton of CO2 captured. As a, as a tax tax break and, and that's starting to, to, to filter through there's lots of projects going on in the us now that really has acted as a catalyst to get a lot of these sort of things going so that, that it's, it's some incentives like that, that 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 are really needed i mean there are all sorts of talks of the, the carbon price continuing to to increase and I, I think you know as the um as we need to get nearer to net zero i think people do have to start paying a lot more towards the, the carbon emissions that, that they're, they're, they're creating so and and you know if it's 20 or 30 dollars the moment it probably will have to go very substantially you know two three four maybe even five times that uh in over the next 10 or 20 years i think uh to, to actually really have a uh have an impact there uh, but but it ha i think it does have to come through some sort of governmental interve intervention or, or even you know, you know something on uh, on the global scale i guess to, to even the level level the playing field to, to all the companies that are uh, around the world yeah yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, I think it's going to be difficult to sell to people. To, to how are you going to tell my mum that she's going to have to pay more money for using her heating and things like that? Um, it's going to be a there, difficult there, there are huge issues there in terms of you know just just travelling. You know, travelling on planes. You know, I, I think we are going to have to cut down on travelling on planes. I mean, you know, yeah, we can we can make synthetic fuels and stuff, but you don't get anything for free. You know, you you all even know synthetic fuels. You've still got to get your hydrogen or your electricity to make the hydrogen. And if you're going to do it on the scale required, then the electricity or the hydrogen that's required, the scales are enormous too. So, you know, there's there's no quick wins as far as I can see. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if anyone else in the audience or the panel um, wants to, to come in with any more points, Matt. Paul, go ahead. Um, Peter, the one, the one thing I, I, was, I was trying to get across is, is some of that is starting to happen at the, the lower cost. So, they say the concrete people are typically paying £30 a tonne for, for their CO2 because the food grade CO2 market is actually relatively cheap, although it's relatively small. But as Chris said, it's got to be it's got to be an international thing. Otherwise, as a country, you're pricing yourself out of the market and you're just going to destroy your own economy. Uh, or you're going to end up reapplying import tariffs based on an assessment of carbon emissions of those pieces of equipment. Uh, because you're quite right, the, the e-fuels agenda that everybody is shouting and screaming about, it's brilliant to reduce the carbon life of that because it's coming from uh, fossil fuels. So you've shortened the, the carbon life cycle from a few thousand years to the sort of 100 year point. But 
the electricity required to generate those fuels isn't just big it's monstrous um it, it is huge and uh, i don't think people quite understand that um i mean some of it's going to clearly go back into plastics instead of oil and that's good because that's at least sequestered for a hundred years or so before it's recycled um but it's starting to happen and corporate and social responsibility is actually pushing it through because people are are requesting it but it needs to be a worldwide agreement and, and at the moment um that sort of leads a little bit to be de desired because the world isn't really agreeing on much at the moment yeah that's actually a really good point so um you picked up on locking carbon up in plastics and that's obviously a longer term storage mechanism for carbon maybe it's a limited scale um but should we be putting a value on the amount the length of time that you lock that carbon up for well, Alex, the, 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 current, the current british and european regulations are doing that and so, so somewhat in america uh, okay. but they're doing it very small scale at the moment and, and probably insufficient carbon value against it to um to to, to make it happen rapidly uh, as i said i think government's going to have to step in for the first one or two or three carbon stores around the uk although i do see bp and shell start to make more noises about turning their rigs into storage uh, regimes yeah. i said he, certainly the irish sea uh, has been the first one to have proper co2 licenses awarded to it this year uh, and that's obviously part of the i deploy project in the northwest for low carbon for blue carbon hydrogen so it's starting to happen if you want it to happen quicker then the carbon price has to go up quicker but that would mean imposing tariffs on anything imported into the country to make sure that you weren't penalizing your own people yeah yeah um so yeah, would any of the other panel like to comment on comment on those points or on if we should be putting a value on the, the length of time, because at the moment we put a value on the ton of carbon, the weight of carbon, but should we be putting a weight on uh, more of a value into the, the length of time that the carbon is stored for? Um, I, I think, think, I think we have to. Sorry. No. Sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. I've spoken already. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, in terms, I think that the stability of the carbon is definitely a metric that should be measured um, and that's something we're looking at with the pyrolysis char that we get from our tires we're really interested to see actually how long is that carbon going to stay out of the atmosphere for because over time it will degrade into co2 um, it's whether that process takes tens of years or tens of thousands or tens of millions of years and that's definitely something we're looking at with our research so i would i would say certainly that stability of the carbon is is very important Chris. Okay, so I think it's a really, really interesting area. And, and I, obviously that, you know, if something's stored for a thousand years versus something stored for, for, for a couple of years, that, then there's a huge advantage there. And, and certainly geological storage is in the, the sort of thousands of years range, at least I, I, I believe it is. I think one of the, the other things that's coming out at the moment is, you know, so many companies or so many uh, entities are, are, are saying that they're going to be net zero by 2020. 30 2050 or, or whatever it is um i don't think many of them have necessarily got a plan as to how they're going to do all of this uh and you know people are sort of relying on carbon credits offset credits and things like that and and i think we're very gonna we're very quickly going to realize that's not a very good method in, certainly in the, in the longer term and you know some of the the practices out there are maybe a, a little dubious at times as, as well um so I think that there's going to be all sorts of things like this that are going to have to be looked at at an international level. Maybe the IPCC or whoever, you know, are going to have to look at all these things and, and find a, a some some way to to actually um, calculate the, the relative benefit of all the different kinds of processes that we we develop. And, and people are suitably rewarded for something that locks CO2 up for a thousand years compared with locking CO2 up for, for six months and then it's just burned as a fuel or something like that. You know, there's obviously huge differences there in terms of the long-term consequences of the, of the, of the sequestration. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Okay, um, so we've... Oh. Sorry, I, I, I agree with Chris. It's going to have to be a staggered approach, really, Peter, um, to, and it's going to be how long is it tied up for. 
Concrete is another interesting one because concrete through its life absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. Um, so the question is, do the alternate concretes still absorb that CO2? Have you got that benefit or have you shortened it or lengthened it? And it needs some scientific research around that. The manufacturers, the technology providers are clearly giving the short term views, not the long term views, uh, because they, they don't really know either whether it will continue to absorb CO2 through its life like normal concrete does, or whether, so, you know, which is the better sink in the end? So there's a lot more research, a lot more information. It's a very, very complex story, and it is not mm. going to be easy for anybody. I agree with Chris. People are promising net zero without understanding or having any real knowledge how they can get there. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Um, and I suppose it, all of this new research um, needs to be done somewhere, whether it's inside a company or whether it's inside a university. And um, there's a question by David Osborne, actually, um, in this chat, who's asked, um, how important are these new discoveries? So if we're going to be making these net zero targets and we're going to somehow make all this new technology to make it happen, um, how important are all these new technologies? So um, Harry and Dominique, you, um, what's your impression of new technologies like fuel cells and algae and um, <laughs> nuclear fusion? Uh, ideas that are almost crazy ideas in some respects. Um, how important are those new ideas going to be? So if I might, um, I would ask a different question. I would reverse it. How prepared the world is for those new technologies? Because you know we are working towards new technologies, we are working towards new applications, but still sometimes, even from my experience, we are hitting the wall because companies are not ready for that. They are still happy and comfortable in, the, in their own zone. Uh, meaning change would come, of course, but would bring also different uh, consequences. Though. So they would have to invest, they would have to redirect their ideas, their purposes, the future of their companies might be also with a question mark you know you don't know what will what will be happening so as much as new technologies are important and we are of course uh, proving that because we are interested in this we want to change something uh, all around the globe the question is as i said is the world ready for it sure harry what's your thoughts on new technologies yeah, from my point of view, uh, like uh, we 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 need the the uh, the novel uh, we need the novel idea we need the uh, novel technologies to reduce the cost and uh, the meaning of the research is uh, find the gap uh, in the real world we we want to meet the gap the research gap so I think uh, yeah we need to keep the diversity of our research direction and then we can find some like some. Uh, other than the traditional capture, uh, CO2 capture technology, for example, and we, we can find some novel idea. We, we can further like uh, reduce the cost of the CO2 capture, something like that. So we need to keep like funding for the research and for the novel idea, but and we can like link to the uh, the practical engineering. We can bring the gap, reduce the cost, and promote the development of the CCS. So. I, I kind of wonder though, um, have we already got these technologies? Do, do we have enough technology as it is? Is it just a matter of policy? Is it a matter of the market being there? Is it a matter of just carbon price? Um, I don't know. David, do you think we've got the technology already? Does it already exist? Yeah, um, uh, some technologies uh, is uh, exciting to to to, to reduce, I will say, uh, CO two emission, and uh, to reduce CO two from uh, from the atmosphere. But today, clearly, we have to improve uh, their efficiency to find the profitability. And uh, it's what we have seen for for the renewable energy, for example, and uh, for the uh, offshore wind power. We see that uh, incremental improvement of the turbine, of the uh, aerodynamics, bring very strong improvement, and, the, and now we could decrease uh, the price of the, uh, the electricity produced by this wind power, and it is uh, uh, it is a, the price now is in competition with the solar uh, with the solar energy with the PV. So. Uh, 
today we, we, we have a lot of technology available. And uh, one of the key point is, uh, I will say in terms of the energy, uh, in terms of technology development is clearly uh, energy storage. I think we have to, to go further in this way. And in second, uh, in second way, it's uh, clearly to, to find a way to produce uh, energy at uh, base load mode uh, without CO2 emission. So okay. fission uh, could be uh, fission could be uh, nuclear power energy could be uh, one of solution, but there is others uh, we have to develop this type of energy. So clearly, we have to develop more and more technology uh, to mitigate uh, climate change. It's a good leverage for academics and for for, for innovative people uh, to uh, uh, to develop this uh, this technology. Yeah, so, so we do need to still develop more technologies. Um, it should, I suppose as an academic myself, um, would you suggest that I start focusing on a particular area? I know that Paul was suggesting earlier that um, we need more people looking into cement and CO2 capture within cement. Um, I know that one of the people looking on the attendee list um, recently, well, not recently, about 10 years probably, he started looking at um, the idea of CO2 and cement. I'm pretty sure he did some research on that. I don't know if he continued it though. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, Alex, you're, you're working on um, tyres, which tyres have been around for ages. And we've seen loads of people been developing projects for tyres. What's What's, I suppose, um, new? How, if we can develop something new for tyres, can we also develop something new for other areas of um, products that we currently dispose of or incinerate? So the pyrolysis for carbonaceous waste is really, really interesting in terms of capturing the CO2 because um, it's an aspect called pyrogenic CCS. Um, and if you look at a tyre, for example, um, about two thirds of that material is from crude oil. However, a lot of it, um, about a fifth to to a quarter, is actually from natural rubber, which grows in trees. And that is when you pyrolyze it and you lock it as char in in that solid form. That's uh, actually a form of BEX, um, which I believe Chris mentioned earlier. So that's that's one example of um, how it can be applied in the waste stream. Now. Something else we're looking at in the longer term is whether we can substitute more biological feedstock into our kiln um, to increase the overall proportion of material that gets counted as BEX. And then we, we might start to get into the negative emissions area that, that Chris mentioned earlier in his slide. Um, so, yeah, I think there's, there's, there's plenty of opportunities um, throughout to um, lock more carbon into solid forms through, through the pyrolysis technology we're exploring. Okay, and I don't know, Chris, would you like to comment on on the new technology idea? I, I, I will. I'm very happy to. I think one of the things I would say, though, there is a lot of technology out there that we should be deploying already. Uh, to, to, we should crack on. You know, that we haven't got time to waste. There are some. You know, there's already ways to do CCS. You know, I showed you the the, the power station in, in 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 Texas. You know, we can already do it on a reasonably large scale. We should be doing that now. We should have been doing it ten years ago, but that's another matter. Yeah. So we should be already using the technologies that we've already got. That doesn't mean to say we're there yet with everything we need. So there's lots of new technologies that I think that that, uh, that are being developed and, and, and still need to be developed. Uh, energy storage, I think, as David mentioned, is, is going to be increasingly important if we're relying on renewables. Um, and, and, you know, that may come down to, to hydrogen, for example. Um, using a lot more renewable materials, though, you know, great if they're a waste stream. Um, one of the things we've uh, in the longer term for seed capture is what we want to do is actually manu manufacture our own components by fermentation because they are the kinds of chemicals you can make by fermentation so you know again it's a sort of a renewable material we're not going to be doing it next year but maybe in five or ten years time that that is sort of the sort of thing we would we would want to to be doing and moving everything away from production from fossil fuels to to a, a more renewable uh, circular economy as much as we we possibly can um nuclear fusion would be great you know uh, but it's always, it's always would have been great. We're still not there yet, and, and I'm not quite sure whenever that is, is going to actually uh, start to materialise. But uh, there's a lot of really good stuff going on with it. But you know, it's always 10, 20, 30 years off. 
yeah, unfortunately, that is the, the problem. It's always 10, 20 years away. <laughs> and um, there, there's lots of limiting factors to get us there. But um, I suppose we can we can at least be hopeful that things like Brexit and COVID won't delay those <laughs> any further. <laughs> Um, I probably get told off of mentioning Brexit on a on a webinar, but um, I feel like it needs to be made, especially when Paul mentioned earlier that um, it might be more difficult to source CO two into the UK now. Um, but um, we're getting close to the three o'clock, so um, I've been told to start wrapping up this um, discussion. So I uh, firstly have to thank all of the, the panelists and the speakers today. Um, thank you very much for your presentations. And, um, before we leave, I'd just like to point out um, the future webinar series that will be running next year, and that will be on the future opportunities for energy storage, um, looking at the chemistry of this and looking at the role in decarbonisation. We haven't confirmed dates yet, but um, keep an eye out in email newsletters um, and on the website for more information. So um, I would now like to bring this webinar to a close, and it's a whole webinar series, in fact. Um, so on behalf of everyone at SCI and um, on the panel, thank you very much for joining and attending. And um, yes, <laughs> um, it's a great success and look forward to seeing you in the next meeting. So thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.